Well, good evening, everyone. Great to see you today. Obviously, I am not Brother Mike, uh, but he is home resting. He had a celebration of life service to do today, and the doctor still hasn't given him the rights to double preach in one day, so uh, I got a pinch hit for him uh, this evening. So if you will, let's uh, bow our heads and begin with a word of prayer this evening. Father, we are so thankful and blessed, uh, Lord, to be your children. Lord, thank you for your love that you have for each and every one of us. And Lord, I pray that tonight as we look at your word and your truth, God, that we would uh, just focus on it and just be real with ourselves, be honest with ourselves, and apply it to our lives in a way, Lord, that as we leave this place, we'd be greater lights in this world than we were before. Father, we just thank you for your everything. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we're going to be in Daniel 1 tonight. And, you know, every time I turn on the television or read a newspaper article, I wonder and, and just observe how much things have changed just over my lifetime. And many people, I hear the old phrase, oh, I wish it were like the good old days, right? Yeah, we have all said that before, right? The good old days. And some are even referring to the leave it to beaver days, which I do know what that show is, okay? I have seen it, not when it was new, but I have seen the, the, uh, the reruns of it. But uh, as we think about this, we have to ask ourselves, though, how good were they really? How, were, how good were the good old days? I think back to the 80s and 90s. I know my parents would say, man, this isn't the good old days. And I'm looking at my kids thinking, well, this is when, wasn't the good old days, and I'm referring to the 80s and 90s, right? So every generation has that looking back thing going on, thinking, man, it, the world has become so much more corrupt, so much more evil than it was back then. But think about it. Back in the Leave it to Beaver days in the 50s and the 60s, it was, it was a good time for white middle-class Americans in the Bible Belt. But if you were an African-American family living in the last bits of segregation in Jim Crow, it wasn't so great, was it? So every decade, every age, every generation has its own good and evil. It's just at times we... As, as time passes by, we tend to forget how bad things really were and focus on how bad things are right now. Larry Osborne once stated, the evils of the past tend to fade from memory while the injustices and evils of the present stand out in bold relief. Now in Ecclesiastes 7.10, it says this, do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask about them. So we see right there that we shouldn't continually live our lives looking backwards, thinking, man, I just long for those days. Friends, every age has its good. Every decade has its bad. As time passes, we must all remember that no matter the day, no matter the decade, no matter the age, God is in control. God is sovereign. And that's what the entire book of Daniel points to is that God is in control. So instead of thinking back to the glory days, we should better equip ourselves for today and how we need to respond to the world that is happening all around us. Our ability to follow Christ is not contingent upon the condition of the age in which we live, but rather on how close we are to the Lord. Romans 12 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So instead of looking around and saying, man, this is just so bad, which I know, it's, that's what we all do. I do it too. We turn on the television and see it, and like, my gosh, this is awful. We need to remember that God has placed us at this point in time for a reason. I always, always have told people, I wish I had been born back in the 50s. That's where I would have fit better. I love the music from that time period. I love the cars from that time period. That, that would just been cool to be from that time period. But that's not when God wanted to be. That's not when God wanted me to be, right? He has you here at this time and age for a specific purpose. And he knew what you would be facing. He knew what you were going to go through. So tonight I want us to take a look at Daniel and see how he responded to his situation, and how we can learn from that. Because tonight I want to see that life is meant to have Jesus at the center of everything. 
And so as we look here in uh, Daniel 1.8, let me go ahead and read that to you. Daniel 1.8, it says, but Daniel, and I, I just love that. Okay, we're going to stop right there, but Daniel. Now, this word but, as, as a father with small kids at home, this just agitates me beyond no end hearing that but word. If you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. I've had to tell my kids several times that my dad is not but dad. It's not hey dad. It's just dad. Okay? So this but word in this context, though, is very, very good. But Daniel. So let, let me give you a little context to this first. But Daniel made up his mind. What did he make up his mind about? He made up his mind to keep Christ at the center and to follow him no matter what. Now, we can say, well, what did Daniel really have going on? What, what was his issue? What was going on? Let me give you some background. In 605 B.C., the Babylonians marched against Judah and besieged Jerusalem. They took some temple articles to Babylon, as well as some of the Judah's finest young men. Traveling from Jerusalem to Babylon over a thousand miles were several groups over a 25-year period. Among these in the earliest group were Daniel, Hannah, Mishael, and Azariah. So when we see this, but Daniel, when it says but, it implies that there was pressure, right? There was some pressure there in making the decision. Not meaning that it was difficult for him to make this decision, but it had some pressure that came with it. And what was the pressure? The pressure was that he was taken from his home, from everything he knew, from his Hebrew uh, Jewish background where he studied the Torah day in and day out. He got taken from his family, got taken from most of his friends, was taken to an evil country, taken to an evil city, Babylon, placed in the evil king's court. Now, Babylon was so bad. We think about Las Vegas. We think about New Orleans. You know what? Those towns could be called that they were in the Bible Belt compared to how bad Babylon is, okay? Even Sodom and Gomorrah do not rise up to how bad Babylon was. If you look at the end of Revelation, you'll see that Babylon is actually used for the name for evil and sin. And the angel comes back when Jesus comes again. It says, Babylon has fallen. It's not referring to the city because it's been gone for thousands of years. It's referring to sin and evil. That's how bad Babylon was. So Daniel gets taken to this evil city, placed in the king's court. Now being a young man, good looking, good stature, solid kid, very intelligent, that's who the king wanted around him. But the king also didn't want to have to worry about these men taking off with some of his women in his court, in his harem, if you will. And so the king made them all eunuchs, okay? If you don't know what a eunuch is, well, just think about castrating a cow and you get a pretty good picture of it. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, what that meant was this Daniel and his friends, they lost their family legacy. They would not have a family now. Back during this time period, your legacy was your family, your sons, your family name. That was gone. But on top of it, the icing on the cake, you say, man, that was bad, that's horrible, that's awful. But what the worst is out of all of this to them would have been that their names were changed. You know, to us today, we think, well, that, that's no big deal. But to them, their name identified who they were. Their name was who God created them to be. Daniel's name, the name of Daniel means God is my judge. Hannah, Yahweh is gracious. Mishael, who is like Elohim. And Azariah, Yahweh helps. So all these boys had strong Hebrew godly names. And King Nebuchadnezzar had them changed to pagan god names. Just try to strip them of everything of who they were. Daniel was renamed Belshazzar, which literally means Bell protect him. 
and his friends, we don't really know what their names meant, but we know that it was quite demeaning to them. But you may recognize them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So all this in context, and how bad of a day, how bad of a week Daniel had when all this took place, we get to verse 8, but Daniel. But Daniel made up his mind. And he would not defile himself with the king's choice food. Now this making up his mind, it was his resolve, his determination to do something. Now I don't know about you, but I know a lot of times when my family and I are trying to figure out what in the world we're going to eat, sometimes I hear this, would you make up your mind already? Right? Y'all with me on that? Would you just make up your mind? Where I take my kids... After they get money for Christmas or whatever, we take them to Walmart or to Target and let them look at the toys on the toy aisle. And after an hour, I'm like, would you make up your mind already? Just make it up. What do you want to do? Well, here Daniel made up his mind. And nothing and no one could change that. To, to made up his mind to follow God in all his life. Now, Daniel very easily could have eaten what was given to him. Think about his situation and his circumstances gone through all that and he sits down and here comes these trays of food t-bones steak and potatoes you know you just name it the king's choice food i'm sure it was quite uh quite delicious and probably just as well good looking as well he chose not to eat it because of the mosaic law that forbade god's people to eat unclean animals or flesh that had been that had not been drained of blood. So he remembered the Torah. He remembered the law. And he upheld that because he had made up his mind. He chose to do what was right and follow in God's word. Daniel had a decision to make. And he made it well. And that needs to serve as an illustration to us that when we choose not to keep God at the center of our lives, things aren't going to go well. That's all over Scripture. Think about Abram and Sarai. You remember what Sarai said to Abram? The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. What was she thinking? Seriously, what was she thinking? And we know how that turned out. Not very good. We're still dealing with it today. Then you move on to the Israelites. God came and rescued them out of Egypt parted the Red Sea, saved them all from Pharaoh and his army. A few days later, they built a calf out of gold and began to worship it. They, they began to try to sidestep God because they didn't have him at the center. They hadn't made up their mind that no matter what, I'm going to follow God. Jonah didn't think the Ninevites should, have be, should be rescued and forgiven, so he went the opposite direction. God found him, didn't he? got swallowed by a great fish, and God finally got through to Jonah. And then we see Peter deny Jesus three times when he put his fear before God. Things didn't turn around for them until they turned themselves around to God. The same goes for us. Things will not turn around for you until you turn yourself around to God. God hasn't turned his back on you. If you feel like he has, it's because you've turned your back on him. So always remember, look at yourself, be honest, and ask yourself, ask the Lord where you're at with him and how much are you standing upon his truth and his word day in and day out. Because folks, I know this world is quite evil. But God has not called us to hunker down, to shelter in, to put a box over ourselves because we're the light. We're supposed to be out there. We're supposed to be living and, and shining brightly. He's called us not to fall in love with the world, but to love the world and to live in it and to live a life in which we'll be shining bright the love of God everywhere we go. 
So friends, whenever you put God first, whenever you make up your mind to stay firmly rooted on God's promises, God grants favor. We see that in the life of Joseph. In Genesis 39, 21, it says, The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. This happens time and time and time and time and time again in the life of Joseph. It says, the Lord was with him. And so the Lord showed him favor. Now look at Daniel 1.9. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. So what did Daniel do whenever he decided that he wasn't going to eat the king's choice food? He didn't go in there all puffed up and macho and made a scene and said, hey, I'm not eating this. You better give me something that I can eat. No, he didn't make a spectacle. He didn't make a scene. God gave Daniel great wisdom. And here it says that Daniel sought permission from the command. He sought permission. He wasn't rude about it. He wasn't arrogant or defiant towards the commander or guard. He just simply asked, knowing that if he was going to do what God called him to do, he had made up his mind. He knew that God would grant him favor. One way or another, God was going to bless that. And so he sought to do what was right in the Lord's eyes, and God granted him that favor. And here, in the book of Daniel, I mentioned this earlier, that the book of Daniel emphasizes God's sovereignty over the world. We see this in verse 2 of chapter 1 here in Daniel. It begins this way. It says, And the Lord handed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, over to him. The Lord handed Jehoiakim. Meaning, the Lord was in control of all of this. God was sovereign. And Daniel continued to keep that worldview that God is in control of all the things that are going on. And we need to walk in that same attitude. In an attitude that what God hands over, He can redeem. What God creates, He can destroy. What God is over, He can control. Which is everything. When we feel the Lord calling us to do something, but yet we see no way on earth it could even be possible. Say yes, knowing that God, if He's calling you to do it, is going to make the way for it to happen. Know that God's going to equip you with the right words, with the right things, with the right skills, the right abilities to do what He's called you to do. When we, when we walk with this attitude that God is sovereign, just as Daniel did, God will grant wisdom as the days come and go. Chuck Swindoll once stated, in a world filled with people who rebel against the divine king, it is inevitable that believers of all ages will face situations in which their convictions will be challenged. We who are parents need to prepare our children for those occasions by both teaching them God's truth and modeling integrity. And all of us who are Christians need to personally commit ourselves to living God's way regardless of the temptations to live otherwise. So, make up your mind that you're going to stay upon God's word and truth, and God will grant favor. And when that happens, everything else will stay aligned. I'm going to read Daniel 1, 14 through 17. So what has happened is that the commander basically let, gave him a 10-day test, a test to see just feed him vegetables and water how they would look compared to everyone else eating the king's choice food. And at the end of those 10 days, they were shown to be better and greater and stronger than those other boys. And this is what it says in verse 14. So he listened to them in this matter and put them to the test for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, they appeared, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. And as for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence and every kind of literature and expertise. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. 
So God not only blessed them physically whenever they made up their mind to stand upon the word of God, but he also blessed them mentally, blessed them with knowledge and intelligence beyond recognition for their age. Friends, you also got to understand that when they went there, they went through a three-year course, not on the Torah. Remember, they didn't; those weren't allowed. But they went through the Babylonian philosophy, the Babylonian false pagan god religions. You could even say like the occult. They were learning very, very bad, evil things. But you know what? They weren't like me in college. You know, my second semester as a freshman in college, I was in a literature class. And part of this literature class, you know, he had to read all these old novels and everything. Well, one of them was about all these Greek gods and goddesses. You know, it's pretty popular back then. I know you probably know what I'm talking about, right? So don't judge me for this, okay? <laughs> but I was there thinking, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These Greek things, those are pagan gods. I, I don't even know all that. And so I didn't. I failed the test. I ended up getting my very first C ever. Okay? Not smart on my part. But Daniel and his friends, they knew better. So they learned the material. Knowing it's not sinful just to have knowledge of it. The practice of it is sinful. And so here they were learning and God blessed it with with them with knowledge and intelligence. You see, they were A plus straight A students in their courses. God used them in a great and magnificent way because they had made up their mind and they knew what to stand upon. So they listened and they followed. God blessed Daniel even spiritually, understanding all kinds of visions and even dreams. So when we are looking at ourselves and what we've decided to do in our lives, and are we standing upon the Word of God? I think about these young men, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and think to myself, they, they must have been standing upon the fundamentals of the faith. And to them, what would have been the fundamentals? Very easy. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 7, they would have this memorized. They would have said this each and every day several times. The beginning of the Shema says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. That is what they live by. That was the fundamental principle in their lives. And so coming into Babylon, that was on their hearts. That was engraved in their minds. And so even standing up, waking up in the mornings in Babylon, what were they saying? They were saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. No matter what pagan gods they were being asked to bow down to, no matter what was going on, no matter what they were being taught, they knew the Lord is one. And they knew that the Lord loved them and that they needed to love God with all that they were, even to the point of giving their lives. And as you continue reading through the book of Daniel, you'll see that happen. You'll see Daniel. We all know all the popular Bible stories from the book of Daniel and Sunday school stories, right? Daniel in the lion's den. You have the fiery furnace. It's a very popular story. But when you really get down to the nitty-gritty of what was really going on, the great stories of faith and persistence in the faith. Friends, to put God first means we come second. And when we come second, that means you must walk in humility. Who, who walks in pride when they are in second place? We are to walk in Jesus' steps. We are to walk in his love and to be his light. You know, Daniel didn't go into Babylon thinking he was the best and the greatest, all puffed up. He didn't go into Babylon on the flip side of it thinking, well, I'm not going to participate in all this and just shut down, zip up his coat and just bury himself and not speak to anybody. He knew God was in control. 
that God still had a plan. And that for whatever reason, him and some of his buddies ended up in this very sinful, evil land, but God still had a plan. Friends, God still has a plan for you in 2023. No matter what laws are passed, no matter what happens today or tomorrow, God still has a plan for you. So let's not hunker down, let's not shelter in and, and, and say no to the world, but rather go out and live for God, knowing that we have made up our mind and nothing can move or shake your faith. Let me close by sharing this. We see boys sent to a foreign land, into a land of sin, having to face an evil king. They sought to defile themselves. They sought to not defile themselves by the king's food, and they bore a faithful and true witness to all the foreign lands there. And 600 years later, we see another Hebrew, one that was sent from heaven to a foreign and sinful land, Facing an evil king, the devil, he would surpass the temptation to follow himself with food from the devil, but rather would live upon the word of God. He, Jesus, came and bore a faithful and true witness to our land so that we, us, would know his love that he had for each and every one of us. Daniel made up his mind to keep the Lord at the center of everything he did. Jesus showed us the way in doing that being the sinner, being God in the flesh. Have we made up our minds? Have you made up your mind that nothing is going to move or shake you in your faith? It's easy to say that, yeah, we, we have faith. But you don't know how strong your faith really is until it's tested. And so in the evil days that we live, I venture to say it's being tested each and every day. Will you say yes to God and go out and shine brightly? Or will you simply look at the world and say, you know what? Kind of pull a Jonah attitude. It's going to hell in a handbasket and there's nothing I can do. I'm safer here just doing my own thing. And you lock the door, close the blinds, and call it a day. Friends, that is not what God has called us to do. He came, he sent his son to redeem the world and you're playing A in sharing that message with everybody else. Won't you go, won't you share, and won't you make up your mind that nothing is going to stop you from doing that. If you will bow your heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and your truth. God, I thank you for sending your only son to die for our sins. Lord, I thank you for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Father, for them standing firm in their faith, for them making up their mind that nothing would move or shake their faith. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us in here today would make up our own minds to do the very same, that no matter how evil the days may seem and what may be on the forefront of the future, that, Lord, that no matter what happens, we will stand firm upon your word and nothing will move us from it. Father, may you bless this night and bless all that are here in Jesus' name. Amen.